Hello there, Evie here. Welcome to my review of the Dynatron K17. Now, first things first, if you want to skip to a particular part of the video, uh, acoustic testing, thermal testing, installation, unboxing, uh, or the conclusion at the end, wrapping up with all the pros and cons and missed opportunities of the cooler, then you can go to the video description. There are timestamps there with all the particular categories laid out for you to go and skip to. But if you're a mobile user, you'll want to go to the first comment, which is pinned, uh, which has all the timestamps there, and those will work for you. The ones in the video description might not work so well. So uh, go down to there if you are a mobile user. You can use it for PC and that sort of thing as well if you want. I also have with me the Noctua NHD9L, which we tested last week, uh, for good reason. I want to go over the, the main reason for doing all these cooler testings and a lot of upcoming cooler testing in the very near future. We have three cooler categories. The categories are 120mm coolers, 140mm coolers, and 160mm coolers. So up for the 120mm coolers, we're testing the Noctua NHD9L that we did last week, and the Dynatron K17 we're doing in this video now, this review now. In the 140mm cooler category, we have the Ryzen Tech Eidos, uh, the Cooler Master Master Air Pro 3, the Cooler Master Hyper 103, and the Thermal Take Contact 21. In the 160mm cooler category, we have the Thermal Right Macho Rev B. I wasn't going to be reviewing that, but I accidentally purchased it, forgetting I wasn't supposed to purchase it, so I did. Uh, so we'll be doing that uh, within when we're doing the 160mm cooler testing. We have the Noctua NHD15S, the Cryrig H5 Universal, not the Ultimate. The Ultimate isn't very compatible with a lot of RAM sticks, and frankly, if I have future bits of RAM uh, or anything like that, then I'd like it to be compatible. This needs to be compatible for a very long time for the test bench. Uh, we also have the Scythe Mugen 5, which looks like a really good contender, and the B quiet dark rock 4. Now there's a little section to the top right hand corner which looks a little bit unfilled so we'll put a little separated line in there and we'll put in another category say an 80mm cooler. Now I mean an 80mm cooler because I'm only going to be testing one. Uh, this is very much testing for tower style coolers. Uh, we've done a lot of uh, top down cooler testing and that won't be so relevant in the future. So that 80mm cooler is the Silverstone AR10 115XS which I have already tested and that is an upcoming review coming very shortly. Now the reason we're testing all of these coolers is we're going to, well, minus the 80mm cooler, we're going to be testing all these coolers individually, uh, then the winner of those will come back, the rest will be shot outside or something, and then we're going to be using these for upcoming case reviews. Now, we've done quite a few case reviews in the past, and I've done my best to keep everything as consistent as possible, but I want to also know uh, what the maximum potential of each case is, and for that, we need to know what, the, what it would perform like with the biggest and best cooler that can fit in the case. So the winners of all these categories will be going for to do further case testing uh, for all upcoming reviews. This should give you a much better idea rather than say having just the Cooler Master Hyper 212 Evo or the, the smallest cooler which we've been testing with the NHL9i. Uh, rather than having one cooler you'll be able to know uh, what the maximum performance you could gain out of it regardless of the size uh, and then we'll be able to uh, create separate graphs and throw all of the coolers all the um, all the cases into one massive graph and you can see the maximum potential performance of that case. That's the idea and hopefully it should work out that way. Uh, frankly, I can't see it working a different way, uh, but there is a certain uh, validity to uh, uh, maintaining a single cooler, but we can also look at the coolers individually in all of these different cases to see how they perform equally. So that's pretty much that. If you want to check out prices, this uh, this K17 varies wildly from country to country. So uh, you can go to the video description and there are Amazon affiliate links which you can check out. If you do purchase anything from there, then the channel will get a small earning from that between 4 and 12% of your total purchase. So I appreciate that if you go and check those out. And I will catch you in a second for the main review and at the end for a conclusion. Spinning the wheel, everyone place your bets as to whether you think the K17 can beat the similarly sized Noctua NHD9L from last week. This will also decide which of these two coolers will be the 120mm cooler for future case testing. If you do comment later, it would be cool to know which you think would have won prior to seeing the test results later. There's not a great deal of packaging with the K17, or much of anything for that matter. Just a plain box, some closed cell foam, a plastic support, and a small plastic bag with the brackets arms. And that's it. We seem to have gotten off to a bad start. Let's pretend I was going to remove the fan first anyway. Like the K17 knew what I wanted and was just really excited to impress us. So the K17's fan can spin up to 2500 RPM. And what's more interesting than that is the fan's blades are angled to push into the spokes, not away from the spokes. Most have at the way around to keep the blades elevated instead of pressed into the frame which could cause additional friction. 
The heatsink itself has a plastic bracket in which to mount the fan onto through a clip in each corner. Like many other coolers around today, the aluminium fins are pressed down along the edges to act as a spacer between the previous fin, which also increases the rigidity of the fins, and directs airflow through the centre of the cooler without allowing some of the airflow created by the fan to be inefficiently pushed out of the sides. Some nice visual touches include the recessed perimeters to the heat pipe tips and the painted top three fins. Although it's slightly less efficient to paint fins, it's right at the top furthest away from the CPU cooler, which is the least efficient cooling area anyway, so it's not all that bad. There's also been some reshaping of the fins to the rear of the cooler to allow clear access to the screws of the mounting bracket, but this functional choice is used further to create a protruding centre section. This protrusion in the fin is not just skin deep, it's pressed into all the fins, the same goes for the Dynatron name in the centre. They're both pressed into every fin down the entire stack. This of course leads to the bottom of the stack, where the heat pipes are tucked in to form a base plate. Something that caught me a little off guard was the included thermal paste that's pre-applied to the base of the cooler. Normally some sort of cap would be applied to the base plate to stop it from being smeared, but not in this case. So the four heat pipes are fixed into the aluminium bracket and are pressed to form a flat base with a large surface area, much like an efficiently designed kettle. Maybe it's something that's more common with server or workstation CPU coolers, but I've not seen a thermal paste application like this, so I thought it was worth taking a closer look. Just before we get onto the mounting of the cooler, it's worth taking a quick look at it with the fan attached. Getting the fan onto the cooler is a piece of cake, it's removing it that's the trick. You'll catch that later on as we go over a quick dismount and thermal paste check. As for the installation of the K17, first step is to slot the backplate arms into the back of the motherboard. They fit nicely to the sides of the socket backplate and have a pre-applied double back adhesive to hold it in place, but frankly this isn't going to be attached to this board for long so I'd rather not deal with any sticky stuff. Back round to the front, it's a good idea to get rid of the RAM so it doesn't get accidentally scuffed, and to install the fan afterwards. I'm not testing this or any of the coolers with the thermal paste they come with, since that's just adding confusion to the mix. Why have another variable standing in the way of comparing the coolers which would go against the point of a fair test? Instead, we'll be using Arctic MX2. Just out of curiosity, I decided to see how this pre-applied thermal paste would spread out after installation. Fixing the cooler to the back plate brackets to the rear of the motherboard is just a case of tightening the spring screws to the base of the cooler, and removing it is just as simple. The spread of thermal paste seems pretty even, there's not a spot on the CPU heat spreader that wasn't covered, and the base plate of the cooler has plenty of excess. It does seem like a waste not to use the thermal paste that's come with the cooler, but after cleaning this stuff off the base plate, it just seems a little dry. Although Arctic MX2 isn't the best thermal paste around, it's got to be better than this stuff. After cleaning that stuff off, it's time for a fresh application of thermal paste. I always put plenty on during initial CPU cooler tests, since you can never tell how effective a mounting solution will be, and all excess will be squeezed out of the sides. Okay, maybe that was a little bit excessive, but if that's not enough, then I don't know what is. We can skip over the mounting of the cooler since we went over that before, but it's worth saying that this is a really simple mounting mechanism and is certainly easier to work with than trying to sort out the Noctua NHD9L to meet its 110mm specification. Feel free to check the review of the D9L to find out exactly what I mean by that. With the cooler fully attached, the fan can be replaced with a simple push. It can be hooked up to the CPU fan header, the RAM can be replaced, and then we can get on with some basic noise testing and some more in-depth thermal testing. Okay, so this is the sound test, rather unscientific sound test. Um, it is 60 centimeters away from the microphone, again as last time, so if we want to jump back and forward between the noises, I don't think it's going to be necessary because what you're about to hear should probably tell you enough. So this is the fan at its lowest speed, uh, so this is I think 20% on the PWM fan curve um, sort of graph thing, uh, and this is running a thousand RPM, so listen to the sound that it makes at that level. Should be able to pick that up. It's it's quite noticeable. Um, frankly, at a thousand RPM, you really wouldn't want this sitting next to you, and this is probably why it really would work in a server environment way more than it would work in, say, a, a PC on your desk or even under your desk. It sounds like an old fan. So let's ramp it up to 2,500 RPM and see where it sits. Actually, no, 60% uh, PWM first. We'll do that one. Okay, so 1,900 RPM we're sitting, sitting at here, 60% on the PWM graph, so 60% power essentially. Um, quite obnoxious at this level. I've got the mouse, just to do a, the click test. 
So yeah, it really is quite loud. So let's ramp it up to 2500 RPM and see how bad it gets. Okay, so it might be me getting used to it, but it doesn't seem so bad. I mean, the, the uh, motor noise of the fan. Uh, there's obviously a lot of noise from the, the S air going through the fins. You can hear this now. But the motor noise doesn't seem so obnoxious, so maybe there's a little bit of wear in there, uh, potentially. Um, I'll certainly be able to tell this over, I don't know, the next hour or so when I'm doing thermal testing and things like that. Uh, but I'll let you know towards the end or after I've finished working with it if the motor noise died off at all. But it's a pretty noisy piece of kit. So yes, I probably would not recommend this. I'll, I'll let you know at the end whether it's a recommendation uh, based on a PC environment on your desk or underneath at the end. So yeah, on to thermal testing. Let's see how it performs. Okay, so we're a lot closer to it now. Uh, this is not scientific. It's about 20 centimeters away. I just wanted to make sure you could hear that fan noise just in case it didn't pick up before. There is, it really is a lot of fan noise, so it's apparently it's a two ball bearing fan, um, but it seems, you know, just too noisy to be comfortable for a daily uh, scenario. So perhaps just based on that, the Noctua would probably be the best choice. But anyway, on to the thermal testing. Just before we go over the thermal testing results, we need to check out how the thermal paste application went. Overall, there was clearly full coverage with a little excess on the base plate of the cooler, but looking over to the CPU heat spreader, you can clearly see the streaks of thermal paste where the heat pipes in the base plate of the cooler fail to make an even surface. Each one of these streaks resembles excess thermal paste, which means inefficient contact between the CPU heat spreader and the CPU cooler base plate. This can be further visualized by the amount of cleaning passes I could perform on the base plate and still pick up thermal paste between the slits of the heat pipes and the aluminium plate. So let's get on to some thermal testing results. We'll start off with Prime 95 and quickly go over the graph setup so we all understand what is in front of us. The graph is in order of cooler size, smallest at the top and tallest at the bottom. This also is represented by the purple bars. The blue bars represent CPU temperature and it's logged in a delta T format, which basically means the temperature of the room is subtracted from the temperature of the CPU. This also allows us to more directly compare the results. There's a blue dotted line which represents the trend line of the CPU temperature. This will become more reliable as we flesh up the charts with more CPU cooler testing, and in the future we can present the graphs with more localized CPU cooler heights to make this feature even more reliable. And lastly, all fans involved in the testing were running at full speed to avoid any fan curve issues. Neither of us really want to work out the exponential increases or decreases in performance due to steadily increasing fan curves. This also goes for the graphics card in the graphics based benchmarks after. So, in Prime 95, the Dynatron K17 can be best compared to the Noctua NHD9L just below it on the graphs, as they are very similarly sized, but the prices vary from country to country. The D9L is supposed to be a 110mm cooler, but due to, let's say, a challenging mounting solution, it's being regarded as a 120mm cooler at this stage. The K17 falls nearly 3 degrees Celsius behind the D9L in Prime 95, and that's not all that bad since it's still better than the taller M9i and Pure Rock Slim. But also bear in mind the K17's fan spins up to 2500 RPM and sounds like a lawnmower, where the other ones just don't. We're going to skip by the Firestrike benchmark results since we don't want to spend too long on thermals, but feel free to pause if you want to check them out yourself. Unigen Heaven sees the K17 just ahead of the D9L and both are ahead of the Hyper 212 Evo, but Superposition sees the K17 nearly 1 degree Celsius behind the D9L. Shifting over to some gaming benchmarks, a really light title like Dirt 3 sees the K17 perform better than the larger cooler like the Hyper 212 Evo, but a couple of degrees behind the D9L. 
and Dirt Showdown shows a similar situation with only 1 degree Celsius difference. Now I know that 1 degree Celsius seems a little petty, but this gap can only widen when adding in an airflow restrictive case to the mix. By that I mean any case. The Rise of the Tomb Raider benchmark is a more GPU intensive benchmark, but still shows the D9L to be the higher performer, but the K17 is still outperforming the 125mm coolers, again keeping in mind the noise levels. Accentuating the CPU temperature differences, Hitman shows us the D9L excelling in this benchmark with the K17 trailing by a few degrees, but the K17 is ahead of the Hyper 212 Evo by a degree. And finally, GTA 5 rounds off the benchmarking, which continues the story we've seen so far. The NHD9L is the better 110mm CPU cooler in terms of thermals, but the K17 isn't all that bad. Just looking at the thermals. So there we go, that's pretty much it for the Dynatron K17. Now in terms of pros, cons, missed opportunities, um, we'll start off with the cons, pretty obvious. The noise that it creates is just too much. Even inside a noise or sound dampened case, like say the uh, Fractal Design Defined Mini C Tempered Glass Edition, uh, this would just be too noisy. Uh, and depending on how much it costs, maybe that's a limiting factor as well in your region. I know in the UK, this thing to pick this up costs £40, uh, but in somewhere like America, it's about $25, whereas the uh, D9L uh, costs uh, the same price pretty much here, about £40 in the UK, and it's about something like between $40 and $50 in, uh, in the US. So if you could get past that noise, perhaps it would work for you, but in, in all honesty, I think this thing would probably drive you nuts if you had it uh, constantly running next to you, uh, even with headphones on. You'd have to go close back headphones on that one if that was your thing, uh, but again, there are better coolers around that make less noise, uh, so that's probably going to be a better option and probably at similar prices as well. I am going to be checking many 140mm coolers that aren't all that much taller than this one, so that might be an option for you. Server environment? Maybe if it's cheap enough, but for your PC, probably not. In terms of thermals, it actually performed relatively okay, um, and depending on the price, it performed relatively well, um, but again, you would have to get past the noise issues. Uh, in terms of its style, not too bad. Build quality, not too bad again, although I have some concerns about the plastic used to clip the fan on and off. If you are going to be uh, um, demounting this and installing it several times, you might, you're going to have to be careful with those plastic clips. Uh, the bracket that holding on, holding it against the, uh, the cooler itself, again, that's probably more of an issue. So that's pretty much it for the Dynatron K17 and the end of this review. If you want to, you can like the video or dislike like the video and always let me know uh, what you liked or what you didn't like in the comments so I can take that feedback on board and know what to keep for future cooler reviews and what to exclude. Same goes for case reviews if you've seen any. Uh, any feedback is fantastic. I can take it on board and work with it. Uh, if you want to check these, uh, check the prices out for these, again, check the Amazon links in the video description for your region. Uh, there's about nine regions covered now. And if you want to go a step further than that, you can always subscribe to the channel and you'll get updates. Um, again, I haven't mentioned this before, but the notification bell icon, you can, you know, to make sure you get them. Again, everyone's pretty much confused about how that works. And you can always share the video uh, to increase its viewability over the internet and perhaps, you know, uh, bring a little bit more um, viewers to the channel if, if you want to support the channel in that way. If you want to go even further than that, though, you can always join the Patreon uh, and donate uh, any amount of money. It will be absolutely fantastic. It allows us to get uh, more things into review, perhaps more interesting things in the future, and we can perhaps record and review in more interesting ways. So that's pretty much it for this video. We've got plenty of CPU coolers coming up. I will be looking to do a review on the Thermaltake Level 20 VT, and I'm looking to get my hands on the Thermaltake Versa H18. A bit Thermaltake heavy, uh, I just noticed. But anyway, thank you very much for checking this one out, and I will catch you in the next one. Bye-bye.